Welcome back to Loom with a Classic and if you're new to my channel I hope you stick around and consider subscribing. I put in your videos every week on some Jaguar and Classic car related content and today's video is a subscriber request. A couple weeks ago I had a competition when I opened my new Loom with a Classic store where you can pick up hoodies like this one. We got t-shirts, stickers and mugs and other cool things are coming along shortly as well. So if you want to check that out there's a link in the description down below. And if you order now, I think you can still be able to get everything by Christmas. I think the end date is somewhere around the 10th or 12th that they guarantee to deliver things to your house by Christmas. So check it out down below if you want some Loma for Classic merchandise under your Christmas tree. So the winner of the competition was Risto, who's gotten a free t-shirt sent to him. Along with that, he also gets a special episode, which is this one. Uh, his favorite episode out of all the ones throughout the year, which was, uh, by the way, that's how... I had the competition. All you had to do was vote on your favorite episode or mention your favorite episode in a comment. His was the AED. So here is part two of AED, the advanced course. If you haven't seen one before, this is a Jaguar AED specific one. They're made by SU. Similar ones were used on other cars as well. A very similar one was used on the Rover P5B. And then there are earlier ones, which are more known as the Hisser, which are electrical. We'll go through those in a future video. I don't know when, because there is one on my 1966 S-Type, which we're going to have to go through, but not really sure when that's happening. However, in the previous video, I took one of these apart completely, showed you all the parts inside, show you basically how to rebuild them, also how to check if the diaphragm is broken or anything. So that's really part one. You gotta check that everything is fine inside. So if you have one of these and it's not working correctly, have a look at the part one video, see what you can rebuild. Um, you can usually get the diaphragm. Sometimes they're out of stock. Uh, you can get all the gaskets, but otherwise the gaskets up top, you can make yourself. I've made a bunch of them, you know, just out of gasket material. However, the diaphragm is a specific thing. So you have to get one of those new and they do wear out, especially if the car's been sitting they get hard and brittle and brake and then I also showed in that video how to set up all the basic settings which should basically get this thing to fire up get your car to start it might not stay running or it might run terribly but it will at least usually start with those those settings if you have a good engine but that's the thing there's a lot more to get one of these running correctly it has to be tuned as well and they're quite specific on how to tune them it's very very small adjustments and you have a very small amount of time to do that adjustment because these really only work when the engine is completely cold that's when they're on fully and that's when they're really finicky uh, however if you get one that's working correctly it's working pretty well on my xj6 we'll have a look at that in a little bit then they work great um, my xj6 it starts first time every time no problem at all this thing works really well a lot of people have issues with them, and this is not the video for, for that. If you don't like them, that's fine. I know they're not perfect, but I think they're a very interesting piece of technology. And if you know how to set them up correctly, they do work well. Um, I haven't had problems with these. I've lately driven two cars with these, and they've always, always worked for me. Usually the biggest problem with them is that a previous owner has been inside them, messed around with them, and haven't gotten it right. Um, so before I show you in real time, basically how do you tune one of these? Well, your car has to be completely, completely cold and then you try and start it. No foot and accelerator, you just start the car and you see what happens. Um, if it kind of catches and dies right away, it is probably, well, it's hard to say initially, but it could be too rich or too lean. So if it dies right away and it doesn't want to restart, it's probably too rich and you flooded it. And that could be two settings. That could be the main sort of jet setting over here, which is just a big square screw that you turn over here. Or it can be the needle lift, which is the needle part that moves here. And this one doesn't really move that well because the diaphragm is bad in this one. And that is set with a little, little screw in there, which I showed you how to set up in the first video. So the needle lift is basically, to explain a simple way, is how much enrichment you get during cranking. It's cranking enrichment. So it's how much it lifts up the needle, and the higher up it lifts the needle, the more fuel you get through. So if that is set too high, you'll flood the engine and it's not gonna start. If it's set too low, 
it may start and die right away because it gets just enough fuel to try and start, but then there's not enough to keep it running. So there's the basics of, of basically getting it to run. Then you gotta give it about 30 or 40 seconds to settle down. In the manual it says that's about how long it takes for everything to go correctly. It will be running too rich at that moment and that's normal for these. They run a little bit too rich the first 30 or 40 seconds. You shouldn't touch the accelerator pedal and then they should smooth out. If it doesn't smooth out then, if it continues to be rich and there's smoke building out the back, of course it's too rich. If it starts to fluctuate in RPM, up and down, up and down, up and down, if it stays running, it is too lean. So that's basically it. Uh, I'd say in total you only have between 40 and 40 seconds and a minute to get this right before you have to let the car cool down completely. So if you don't get it running correctly by that time, you're thinking, oh, it's too lean. Let the car warm up, let this thing completely shut off, then turn the car off, wait until everything is cold again, remove the cover, make it a little bit richer, and try again. So it's a lot of trial and error, and that's why it takes a long time. It takes days to set up one of these correctly, and Sometimes even if you have it, you think it's set correctly and it works great. Maybe once fall comes, it's still a little bit too rich and you have to change it. So it takes a while to get one of these set up correctly. But when you do, they do work really well. So let's hand over to the XJ6 and see how that thing cold starts. It's been sitting for about a week and a half now. Here's the engine of my 1975 XJ6. There is the AAD sitting between the two SU carbs. It shares the same fuel supply, so it has its own hose up to an old float chamber, but it gets fuel from the same basically metal pipe down there that you see that the carbs get as well. So when you turn on the key and you fill up the float chambers of the carbs, that float chamber fills up as well. Just a small one down in there. Then there is a T-pipe over there, so the fuel air mixture gets fed into both of the carbs there. Goes into inlet manifold and then into the engine. So you see right over there, so I put my finger on it, the light there, right there, see that gray pipe there? It's gray because I've wrapped it in basically heat wrap that you use on racing engines. Because originally there is an insulation on this pipe and it's, uh, you know, it's often destroyed because it's 45 years old. So I wrapped them in this sort of exhaust heat wrap. It works really well also. So that is the air into the AED. It goes over here, and then, I'm not sure if you can tell, but you have the yellow clamps there, piece of rubber line, and there it's where it goes up. So it grabs hot air from the other side of the engine, over where the exhaust is, goes behind the block over there. So if you have a look over at the exhaust, you can see that there it goes, and it goes into the rear exhaust manifold, back under, under it down there. And there is a little metal gauze filter in there. So that's also good to check that that thing isn't blocked. It can rust out and then, you know, just block. You can clean them out if they're not rusted in, uh, you know, any type of solvent really, just to clean them up where you can get new ones as well. So it gets hot air from behind there, goes around the engine, and that goes in there. So it's really important that it does get hot air. It's the hot air that turns it off. If it never gets hot air, it's never going to turn off. Your choke is never going to turn off. It's going to run rich all the time. You're going to have issues. So one way to know that this thing is turned off is that this pipe over here gets warm. So initially it's going to be really cold. You can even see ice forming on it if it gets really, really cold. And then as that thing warms up, that pipe will get warmer and warmer. And pretty soon it'll be really hot. And then that means that the AED is completely turned off. I just hooked up the battery, so let's close the bonnet and we'll see how this thing starts up after sitting for a while. I hear the fuel pump ticking away, now the carbs are full. All right, in here it started up. It is possibly a little bit, little bit lean right there. All right, it's running about 900 RPMs now, so I'm just gonna back it out of here. 
go around the house and then we can have a closer look at everything. So I've just driven it around my house and you see it's already starting to slow down a little bit in RPM, sitting around 950, 1000 RPM, which is good, ideal. You want it around 1000 RPM. However, it's fluctuating a little bit, which indicates that it is a little bit on the lean side because I set this thing up when it wasn't as cold outside like it is now. It was a little, little bit on the lean side, so I will adjust it a little bit. I'll show you how I adjust that in a little bit. Let's just go out and feel if things are starting to get warm. It's very, very windy outside. I do have a wind deflector on my microphone, so I hope you guys can still hear me well. Okay, so everything is running out. See, it's, of course, exhaust is hot here. Pipe is starting to get warm. It's not ice, ice cold, but starting to get a little bit warmer. We'll go around to the other side and feel the feed pipe. That is starting to feel warm even through the isolation as well. This thing is starting starting to warm up. So this thing, I've driven it too far now to do a restart and sort of recheck it. But I will turn it off now. We'll reset this, we'll refire it. And then the next time I'll see if it runs better or not. It's not gonna be in this video, but I'll basically show you how to make those micro adjustments and then you just you know, do another cold start when everything's all cold again, and you check again. So it started up pretty well, but you saw it sort of went down a little bit right way and it fluctuated a bit. So that indicates it's a little bit too lean. It's not a lot too lean. It's just a fine, fine amount too lean. So I will be making just a tiny, tiny adjustment. And that's the thing. It's very, very small adjustments once you get down to the fine tuning, which I'm doing at the moment. So lift off that Bakelite cover and you will see two screws here and here and then there are two lower ones only focus on the top ones make sure to have a therm hold of it because it's spring loaded and the threads are uh, quite sensitive so you don't want to strip them out having the springs pull on the threads when you screw, unscrew them it is an extremely extremely windy day today uh, but i don't have any space inside the workshop so we're gonna have to do this outside and I hope that the new wind deflector is actually helping. It's a good test for it anyways. All right, here's that out of the way. That's what it looks like on the inside. Nothing really special. That's just a little bit of thread locker tape I have on there because my threads are a little bit worn out on this thing, so that helps. Here is a gasket. It's just a homemade gasket I've made because at the moment, at least, you can't get gasket sets for these. You can only get... Uh, the uh, complete rebuild kit for them. So I only need a gasket here, so I made one. Here is the main mixture adjustment, that square screw there. So, like I mentioned in the first video, when we went through this, clockwise is leaner, anti-clockwise is richer. We're gonna richen it up a tiny, tiny amount. I mean, about a an eighth or a sixteenth of a turn, that's it. And we'll leave it well enough alone. And I don't know how it's gonna run now. It's probably gonna run a little bit better now half warmed up as well but we're not going to know the full results until a next cold start or sometimes several cold starts so that's what i'm going to do now i will adjust that we'll put it all together we'll see how it runs now and then i will update you guys how it runs on a future cold start on my instagram channel later so i will unscrew it anti-clockwise a tiny tiny bit and that's it now we're just going to put it all back together. But before we do that, here's the thing we didn't see before. This is the main bimetal spring. You can also adjust these a little bit. So if the thing doesn't start up, one thing to check is open up here and if you see fuel. If there's fuel in there, this thing is working let it through. It's either flooding it or you have other issues. If you're not getting any fuel here, this thing could be too close. So this thing uh, opens up that way so you get a wider gap here when it gets warm so you can carefully bend this to make small adjustments so mine wasn't really shutting off fast enough it would stay on for way too long 
So I push this thing up just a tiny, tiny bit. I measure what it was before. I pushed it up a tiny, tiny amount, put it back on, and then it worked perfectly. After you do that, you will probably have to adjust the idle speed, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. So you put all this back together, make sure that thing goes under the spring like I showed in part one. We'll screw this all back down. Once again, you hold on to it. Make sure that you don't strip out the threads anymore. I will have to take this thing apart completely uh, sometime soon and put heli coils in one of them because uh, they're, you know, a little bit stripped out from previous owners, but so far it's only one of them a little bit and that tiny bit of thread locker on there or uh, uh, what's called that kind of, you know, plumber's tape. It really, it's enough to get it to work at least. So you might see some blanking plugs up here. This one is a needle lift. Clockwise, you get less needle lift. Anti-clockwise, you get more. So if you had the needle lift problem we talked about before, that's where you adjust that. Here, I'm missing a blanking plug, uh, is the idle adjustment. So anti-clockwise is a higher idle and clockwise is a lower. So to set the idle, once everything else is set correctly, start with a cold car, turn it on, let it do its thing, let it settle down after about 30 seconds or so then adjust that until you have about 1,000 RPMs, but you only have until it's about a minute uh, to make all those adjustments. Okay, let's fire it back up and see how it goes. I just went inside the car and as you can see, the idle speed actually went up a tiny bit, so the engine liked getting that tiny little bit more of fuel. So the next time I start it cold, I'll have to have a little screwdriver ready to possibly lower the idle a little bit, but I'm gonna let this be for now. Uh, you see it's starting to come up with temperature, so it should start shutting off pretty soon. However, because it, you know, sort of turn it off and turn it back on again, that pipe has gotten cold again. That's why you can also get weird readings. So if you continue to make adjustments, but the engine is sort of warm, but you have, you know, the bonnet open and you stop it for a while, that pipe will get cold again and you'll get weird readings. That's why you should do a complete test Start from cold and let it completely warm up and see how it goes. I'm just gonna let this thing uh, warm up now so it completely goes down and then I'll show you what it looks like when it's all turned off. I just drove the car really quickly basically around the block and now the AED is completely turned off. I went out and checked that pipe is hot and you can see the idle now is down where it should be at about 750 rpm. So everything's working as it should, it's turning off and uh, I think it should be set up pretty correctly now. And that's it for this episode. I hope you guys got a little bit more understanding of the more advanced part of tuning one of these. It is a little finicky, but you can definitely set it up to work correctly. As long as all the bimetals are moving, you don't have any air leaks, the diaphragm is good in the middle, and you have some patience, you can get these set up to work correctly. I know there are alternatives. You can put a uh, sort of cam mechanism on top that does the work of the bimetal and you have a manual choke cable. However, it's not the bimetals are usually issues in these. It's usually a diaphragm and everything in the bottom. So if you buy one of those kits, it may work. It may not work because maybe the bottom half of your AED is, is still bad. So I think it's a lot better if you want to keep the AED to actually get it set up correctly. And now you know how to tune it correctly and hopefully you can get yours working well. You can also put complete manual choke on these cars, especially if you have the carbs I have. There are, um, you can buy the parts for to make a manual choke for them. Certain companies sell a kit. We can also look at other cars like the uh, Rover P6 with the four cylinder engine, had the same carbs and had manual chokes. So you can get some parts from those and get that to work, but that is, uh, that is nothing in this video at least. Uh, I have a friend of the channel who has an XJ6 Series 1 that was converted completely to manual choke. So uh, when the whole COVID thing is um, hopefully over and we can meet people again, I'll have a look at that car and I can maybe show you guys what that um, choke setup looks like and we'll ask the owner see if he's happy with how it's working. Anyways, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, please do subscribe to the channel. It really does help out a lot. And head on over to the Live With A Classic store if you want to pick up some cool merchandise and just have a look around. The link is in the description down below. Anyways, until next time, I'm Adam and this was Live With A Classic. I'll see you soon.